So our first targets in the search for signs of life in the universe are orbiting near what astrophysicists call M-type stars. And these young M stars tend to be very active, flaring frequently and causing UV fluxes on the surface of the planets nearby. And strong UV flares can be biologically harmful, as I'm sure we've all likely experienced with a bad sunburn from spending too much time at the beach on vacation. One biological photoprotection method, or a method to protect life from UV rays, is biofluorescence. And biofluorescence upshifts UV wavelength to longer, safer wavelengths. And the scientists whose research this poster was based on suggest that we could use this biofluorescent biosphere signature to detect and reveal life on other planets. But what I hope to show you today is that we're already living on a glowing biofluorescent world. This isn't just a potential way to search for life on another planet or a science fiction phenomenon, it's embedded in the systems around us. We're already living on a glowing planet. So let's explore this glowing planet that I'm saying we live on. What's this thing called biofluorescence that I keep mentioning? Let's start there. In the most simple terms, biofluorescence is glowing life or glowing species. But there are two ways that species can glow. These are called biofluorescence and bioluminescence. You're likely most familiar with bioluminescence, so let's discuss that first. Bioluminescence is the biological production of light. It's likely that you've witnessed this by seeing a firefly or a lightning bug in your backyard, or remember the glowing lure hanging in front of the anglerfish's face in the Finding Nemo movie, or maybe you've been able to paddle or swim through the ocean while bioluminescent plankton are out. These organisms all glow via bioluminescence. Now here we have a depiction of the bioluminescent tree of life with representations of many of these glowing species, from bacteria to fungi to fish to worms to insects, squid and crabs, bioluminescence is present in many different types of organisms. The interesting part is they all glow using the same exact mechanism. With a special molecule called luciferin and a little bit of oxygen, all of these species glow in the same way. I want you to take a minute to think about that. Look at the diversity of bioluminescent species on this tree. A single-celled algae and the 46-foot-long colossal squid glow in the same exact way, using this molecule right here. Pretty incredible, right? I would say so. So we have all these glowing species that are bioluminescent. But what's biofluorescence? And how do biofluorescent species glow? So have you ever been to a bowling alley or a haunted house where your shirt and your shoelaces glow bright under the black lights? That's fluorescence. And when living organisms do this, it's called biofluorescence. So biofluorescence is another way that species can glow, but instead of producing their own light, like with bioluminescence, they absorb light and they re-emit it in another color. And some species can fluoresce in wavelengths outside of the range of colors that humans can see. So it'll change something that looks like this to us to something like this. Now let's talk a little bit about the science of biofluorescence so we can really understand what's going on here. Firstly, biofluorescence is found in species across the tree of life, just like bioluminescence. We see it in over 180 species of fish, hundreds of species of corals, in jellyfish, sharks, rays, shrimp, sea turtles, in penguin beaks, and parrot feathers, and owl wings. It's in every species of scorpion. We have biofluorescence in species of spiders, butterflies, beetles, bees, dragonflies, millipedes, cockroaches. Nearly all plants are biofluorescent because chlorophyll is fluorescent, and that's their bark, leaves, fruits, and flowers. We also see it in amphibians, from frogs to salamanders to Sicilians, and many reptiles, snakes, lizards, and turtles. Now I want to revisit these images that I just showed you for a second. Look at the differences in biofluorescence. Each organism glows in a different color and a different pattern, and these differences in fluorescence are related to its various functions in each species. So what are some of the reasons we've found for our species to be biofluorescent? It can act as a signal of condition. We see this with leaves and fruits and even mammal tissues. It can act in attraction, both for mates and other species. It can act in interspecies recognition, so telling if an individual is part of your own species. We've also seen it play a role in a warning to predators and camouflage as a lure for photo protection, like we talked about with those extraterrestrial planets at the beginning, and symbiosis and male-male aggression. So I'm gonna take you through several examples 
of these reasons so that you can get a better understanding of biofluorescence. First, many flowers have UV patterns, specifically this bullseye pattern that we see pictured here. It's predicted that this pattern is used by pollinators like bees that can see in the UV range to focus in on the area for pollination. The UV bullseye pattern makes it easier for the pollinators to find the reward of nectar right in the middle of the flower where the bullseye is and therefore aids in pollination. Here's another example. In the top image, you'll see a red fluorescent scorpion fish perched on red fluorescent algae, and in the bottom photo, a green fluorescing nematerid fish near green fluorescing coral. As you can see, the fish are located near organisms in their environment that are fluorescing the same color, likely aiding in their camouflage. And here's an example with the jumping spiders. So the top image is of male spiders on the left and females on the right in natural light, and the bottom image is the same spiders under UV light. Researchers found a decrease in the number of courtship responses when the UV wavelengths were removed. Male jumping spiders were uninterested in females that lacked fluorescence, and females were uninterested in males that lacked fluorescence. Now here's an example that's a little closer to home. Fluorescence isn't always connected to a communication signal. It can be a product of cell aging. We see this in ripening fruits. For example, these bananas pictured here, as they become more ripe, they also become more fluorescent. But we also see this in aging mammal tissues, like the heart, liver, and kidney that we all have in our own bodies. And we can see an example of this in the image on the bottom right, where we have images from a four month and an 18 month old rat, where the white fluorescence in the brain increases with age. So theoretically, you could take a black light and use the emitted fluorescence to tell the age of both your fruit and your body. Now an example much further from home. Let's look into the deep sea. So siphonophores are a colonial hydrozoan related to corals and jellyfish, and they have a red fluorescent lure at the end of their tentacles to catch prey. Because siphonophores are mostly deep sea creatures, there's not much ambient blue light to excite this fluorescence. Hence, they have to produce it themselves via bioluminescence. So siphonophores are both bioluminescent and biofluorescent. The tentacles are blue luminescent and only produce red biofluorescence once they mature, when they are then hypothesized to use it as a lure, as you can see by the action in this video. Now this might remind you of the bioluminescent lure of the deep sea anglerfish. The depths of the ocean are a dark and a lonely place, making communication via light very valuable, hence why it's likely that we see so much bioluminescence and biofluorescence in marine species. So here we've seen examples of biofluorescence used to communicate between species with flowers and pollinators, within species with the jumping spiders, for camouflage in reef systems, and as a sign of condition in fruit and a lure in siphonophores. I want to talk about one last special example that has really important implications. The crystal jellyfish is both bioluminescent and biofluorescent. It produces a blue glow via bioluminescence. Then the light from that blue glow excites a green fluorescent protein causing green biofluorescence. Research on green fluorescent protein, or GFP as you may have heard of it, garnered the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. It's now been used extensively in the medical field as a marker to identify and examine biological processes using a method called fluorescence microscopy. And it's a great tool because it's heritable and will show continued expression of the cells and tissues it's expressed in, and it doesn't interfere with biological processes. So we, here we have another example of biofluorescence applications in real life. Now let's understand how this biofluorescence actually happens. So biofluorescence is the result of natural fluorophores, which are just chemicals that fluoresce. And there are many natural fluorophores, which are all organic, organic chemicals with their own fluorescent emission wavelength. If you look at the few examples of fluorophores that I have up on the screen, you'll see some similarities with their structure. Specifically, they all have rings, which shows their organic chemicals. You also might notice some of the names. We have green fluorescent protein up there, which we just discussed. And we also have chlorophyll, which you might recognize as what makes plants green and allows them to photosynthesize. So there are hundreds of fluorophores. So each fluorescent organism glows in a slightly different way, in contrast to bioluminescent organisms, which all glow in the same exact way. 
Now, how does this really work to change the color? So light acts as a wave. Each color has a different wavelength, the measurement between the two peaks of the wave, and the wavelength of each color is different. So the wavelength of red is longer than the wavelength of purple. Here, the wavelengths of light visible to humans are labeled in the bottom left corner, and some organisms can also see wavelengths in the ultraviolet range. So biofluorescence is the result of absorbed light being re-emitted at a longer wavelength due to fluorophores. And the wavelength of light determines if we can see it or if an organism can see it and what color it appears as. So fluorescence shifts this wavelength to a new color. And the diagram to the right depicts this shift. It's called Stokes shift. So as you can see on this diagram, the blue light is absorbed and then fluorescence increases that wavelength and re-emits it at a longer yellow light. Now let's put this all together in an example. So we have a green leaf, which we know has chloroplasts, which we know have chlorophyll. We just learned that chlorophyll is a fluorophore that has a, an excitation wavelength of 480 nanometers and an emission wavelength around 700 nanometers. So if we take blue light at that 480 nanometers and we shine it on this green leaf, the chlorophyll fluorophore will increase the wavelength of the fluorescence and re-emit it at a red wavelength red color around 700 nanometer wavelength, turning it to red fluorescence. And the amount and wavelength of the red fluorescence of plants has been correlated with environmental stress conditions and is now used as a tool to gain information about pollutant and stress effects on plant health, another real world application. So I want to emphasize that biofluorescence can reveal the unseen. If you look at this image on the left, you'll see just plain sand in our eyes. But when we look at these images in fluorescence, on the left, we have hermit crabs and shrimp that are exposed. And on the right, the tomato plant turns bright red and the hornworms are much more visible as bright green in contrast. We live in this glowing fluorescent world that we just don't have the ability to see. Now let's talk a bit about the biofluorescent organisms that I study, frogs. The first biofluorescent frog was discovered just three years ago in 2017, and it was discovered by mistake when someone accidentally shone a black light on a frog. Because it was just discovered, we still don't know why frogs are biofluorescent, which is where my research comes in. So since 2017, researchers have found biofluorescence in over 35 amphibian species, and across the three main groups of amphibians, frogs, salamanders, and the rare burrowing amphibians, sicilians. Personally, I've discovered fluorescence in five genera of frogs and documented the first notes of intraspecific variation in fluorescence. This means that individuals of the same species do not always have the same amount of fluorescence or the same fluorescent pattern, and the discovery provides more evidence that biofluorescence is playing a role in frog ecology and evolution and isn't just a byproduct, leading to my research of trying to understand its role. We're also seeing differences in the excitation and emission spectra of amphibian species which you can see from the range of fluorescence colors from greens to blues in these photos. Now let's look at frog biofluorescence a little more closely and the evidence we have for why it may be playing a role. But remember, there are all of these different mechanisms of biofluorescence. And we only know one in one frog species. It's a hyaline molecule. But different frog species may have different fluorophores underlying their fluorescence, again, adding to the evidence that it may play a role in some frog species. Now let's look at amphibian fission, because biofluorescence can't be playing a role if frogs can't see it. Because a lot of biofluorescence is within or close to the UV range, let's look at UV fission in frogs. There are two ways that frogs see in the UV range. Firstly, their lens can be sensitive to that range, which is what we're seeing here in this table. Many of these lens sensitivity wavelengths fall into the UV range from about 200 nanometers to 400 nanometers when we're comparing it to the spectra diagram above. But amphibians also have an extra rod with sensitivity in the UV range. So rods help us to see in dim light and cones help us to see in bright light. Having an extra rod, this blue sensitive rod, helps them to better see in dim light. The most exciting part of this is how frog biofluorescence, excitation, and emission spectra interact and line up with these rod sensitivities. So here I have listed the excitation and emission ranges we've already found frogs to biofluoresce at. 
And if you line these up with frog spe spectral sensitivity, you see that biofluorescence pushes emission wavelength to the most sensitive range of green sensitive rods. Because there are more green sensitive rods than blue sensitive rods in frog eyes, and the emission is pushed to the wavelength of high sensitivity in the green sensitive rods and even in the red sensitive cones, Fluorescence is making frogs easier to see by other frogs. And this is in dim light, which is when frogs are very active and specifically when they're mating. So perhaps frogs are using biofluorescence to communicate with potential mates. Here's some evidence I've found locally to help test that hypothesis. So here we see the squirrel tree frog or Hyla squirrella, and you notice they have a white stripe down their body. This white stripe I found to be fluorescent. Researcher has, researchers have also found this white stripe to act as a secondary female preference cue in squirrel tree frogs. So the females first listen to the auditor, auditory signals from males, and then they approach different males, and they use this white stripe as a preference cue to choose who to mate with. But perhaps it's the fluorescence of the white stripe driving the female preference and not the white color. Now let's look at predator vision. Many predators of frogs can also see in the UV range that frogs are biofluorescing in. Some birds have an extra cone with sensitivity in the UV range as seen by the absorbance spectra on the right. And additionally, while owls, a main predator of many frog species, don't have this extra cone, they have UV transmitting eye media that allows them some sensitivity in the UV ranges. So there's reason to believe that bird predators are likely also seeing frog biofluorescence. Now what about snakes, another main predator of frogs? While snakes use smell for most prey hunting, it's predicted that many of the nocturnal species of the group of snakes containing over 80% of snake species have UV sensitive optic ranges. This is based on their most recent common ancestor having this stripe as well. So it's likely that, that snakes can see frog biofluorescence too. And mammal predators? Some rodents and marsupials have a fourth cone, just like birds. And other mammal predators, like ferrets, have lenses that allow UV through, similar to owls. Now I want to point out that human len lenses block out most of the light between 300 and 400 nanometers, which is the range of wavelengths that a lot of biofluorescence, including frog biofluorescence, is in. And this is why we can't see most of the biofluorescence surrounding us, at least without the help from special glasses or UV filter, or without special lights or UV filter glasses. So we know predators and amphibians can see in the correct range to see their biofluorescence, but what does this really mean? So biofluorescence could help frogs blend into their environment that's also fluorescent filled and blend into that background, helping them to camouflage and invade predators. As patchy fluorescence was found to be correlated with camouflage function in fish, and we now have discovered patchy biofluorescence in frogs, this may provide evidence for testing this hypothesis. Alternati alternatively, biofluorescence may make frogs more visible to predators, but may act to deter them, similar to how bright colors of poison dart frogs and coral snakes warn predators of their toxicity. Specifically, rodent predators of the polka dot tree frog, that first biofluorescent frog that was discovered, are deterred by the irritating secretions of the frog. These secretions are also fluorescent, as pictured here. When the researchers picked up the polka dot tree frog, they saw the secretions were left on their gloves and they were also glowing. So perhaps biofluorescence is used as a warning mechanism to predators. Now, all of this information leads to my main research focus, trying to understand the role of biofluorescence in mate choice and prediction of frogs. To do this, I describe the variation of biofluorescence, run female preference tests, and predator encounter experiments. So first, to understand the function of biofluorescence in frogs, we have to understand its variation within and across species. So to begin to understand this variation, I catch frogs, shine a light on them at the excitation range that we have found other amphibian biofluorescence at, recorded, record notes about the color, pattern, and distribution of the biofluorescence, and about the environment, like the time of day, breeding season, etc. And then I collect the emission spectra using a spectrometer, which is pictured here. And this gives me the excitation and emission spectra by reading the wavelengths of light that are emitted off of the frog. I can then know the peak emission wavelength and intensity of the fluorescence and use these parameters to compare fluorescence across individuals and species. And this work helps me to decide which species I should focus on for the mate choice and predation experiments. 
I can see if the fluorescence is in a biologically important place, like the vocal sac, or if wavelengths match a predator's visual sensitivity. I've also been collaborating with other researchers to help aid in collecting data on amphibian biofluorescence that I wouldn't have access to, like the Detroit Zoo, the Coastal Plains Institute, and the QCAS Museum in Ecuador. And this again allows me to test a wider range of amphibians and understand their biofluorescence. So I then want to see if biofluorescence plays a role in mate choice. To do this, I set up female preference tests where I place two males in an arena, filter out the fluorescence of one male, and I see if the female chooses the male with the fluorescence or the male without the fluorescence. I can repeat these tests with different fluorescent patterns or species or acoustic calls to start untangling if biofluorescence is important in species recognition and how it interacts as a cue with acoustic signals. I'm also collecting blood and DNA samples from individuals with more and less biofluorescence to see if there's a hormonal or genetic difference correlated with biofluorescence. Perhaps a reproductive hormone like testosterone is correlated with an increase in biofluorescence. Now to test the effects of predators. I'm making and placing wax model frogs. I paint some of them with fluorescent patterns and leave some of them normal. I put them out and look at the interactions with predators by examining bite marks, claw marks, and using cameras. This helps us to determine if biofluorescence deters or attracts predators and how it might be affecting different predators differently. Finally, I can use all of this information to start to understand if and how biofluorescence is affecting the evolution of amphibian species. I can map biofluorescent traits like excitation wavelength, intensity, pattern, color, function, etc., onto the relationship tree of frogs and see if these traits correlate with an increase in speciation or other evolutionary processes. So here's an example of mapping different colors of fish fluorescence onto their phylogenetic tree. Now the findings of this research are not only going to better help us understand how frogs communicate and interact with their environment, but this knowledge can also help us better be able to protect and conserve ecosystems, specifically amphibian species, which are a huge indicator species that provide insight into the health of our environments before humans even know what's wrong. Similarly to green fluorescent protein applications, understanding other fluorophore chemicals can provide uses in the medical field for microscopic tracking and imaging as well. Now, I love my research, but science isn't as useful unless it's shared, and I can't possibly study all of the wonderful aspects of fluorescence myself, so I created a way for you to get involved in finding fluorescence. There's still so much we don't know about fluorescence, mostly because we just haven't taken the time to shine a UV light on every species, so finding fluorescence is a resource I created to help with this problem. Finding fluorescence is a resource to teach about biofluorescence, get people involved in and excited about making discoveries, and to document the presence or absence of biofluorescence in the vast number of species across the world in a format accessible to scientists of all fields. And to reach these goals, Finding Fluorescence uses citizen science and educational resources. So let's talk about the citizen science first. If you remember from the beginning portion of this talk, many species of plants and animals glow. With an inexpensive black light and UV filter glasses, you can find biofluorescent plants, insects, amphibians, reptiles, fungi, fish, and much more in your own backyard. These are all images uploaded to the Finding Fluorescence database by citizen scientists, real people just like you. Here's a quick video to show you what the citizen science fluorescence discovery looks like in real time. So this video was taken in a Michigan backyard. And as you can see, once we put the filter glasses on, the green leaves turn bright red. There's also a spider in the frame that has a little bit of green fluorescence on his back. And then when he turns, you'll see he also has green fluorescence on his underside. And so the data that's being generated by this resource is extremely valuable. I just spoke with the director of herpetology at the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology today, who brought his black light into the collections and found fluorescent tubercles in a new species of chameleon and sent me this photo this afternoon, this middle photo of the chameleon. We also had this photo of biofluorescence in a sand crab, or you might know it as a mole crab, from New Jersey posted onto the Finding Fluorescence website, which is the very first documentation of fluorescence in that species as well. So it's pretty incredible that you can make a huge scientific discovery having fun with a black light in your own backyard. 
Now that being said, one of the scientifically important features of finding fluorescence resource is the database that's created from the data that citizen scientists upload. This is data that can be accessed and download, downloaded for free by anyone and can help scientists better understand the diversity of biofluorescence across all taxa. It can also help us better understand how biofluorescence is affected by geography, seasons, and other environmental factors. And people can easily upload whatever they find through a phone app or an online web page. And again, this is also where students can interact and act as real scientists and put their data into these real applications. And that leads into the second feature of the resource of education. So biofluorescence provides a unique opportunity to teach and learn about the three main topics of science, biology, chemistry, and physics, all in one lesson. And Finding Fluorescence offers free downloadable worksheets that you can use in your classroom, at home, or with your student groups. And so this connects the fun activity of taking a black light outside and discovering fluorescence in your world to the science behind it. And all of these resources are currently available in both English and Spanish. Now we also offer finding fluorescent kits for a free rental. And so these can be requested by classrooms, summer camps, scout troops, or anyone that wants to do this finding fluorescence activity, but doesn't have the funds to support the equipment purchasing. So they can rent out this free equipment and do the activity with their students. Now, here I'm just gonna walk through the finding fluorescence site to give you a little bit of a better idea of how this works. So this is just the homepage of the Finding Fluorescence site that tells you a little bit about what it is. Here we talk about biofluorescence and what it is, go through the biology, the chemistry, the physics of biofluorescence, similar to what I did in this talk today. And this is where students and teachers could learn about biofluorescence before they teach it. Under the Get Started tab, you can find information about how to get involved in the citizen science part of this resource, how to download the app to upload your findings. There are also links to affordable black lights and filter glasses where you can get them for only a few dollars. It shows you how to tell what you're looking at and how to find that fluorescence. Here's where you can download the different worksheets about biofluorescence. Um, and you can do different case studies with your students so they can understand what's going on. And again, there's biology, chemistry, and physics worksheets, as well as just a lab where they learn about experimental design. Here's where we talk about finding fluorescent kits and how to request those, as well as how to donate to cover the cost of a finding fluorescent kit that a group could rent out. Here is where all the citizen science data is uploaded and where you can access that database. You can also view this database in a map form, so you can zoom into your hometown and see if anyone has found biofluorescence near you. You can also click on a specific observation, look at all the data they input. Here, someone found a mushroom that has biofluorescence and they uploaded a picture under UV light and in natural light, so you can see the difference. There's also the place where you can upload data through the form on the web, or you can do it through the app. And then there's a contact page where you can request finding fluorescence kits or different classroom modules that aren't yet available. And again, all of this is also available in Spanish at the moment as well. So in this talk, we've seen that there is a bioluminescent world that's glowing in front of our eyes, but there is also a biofluorescent world that's often hidden from human sight. And if you gain one thing, I hope it's that you now understand we live in a glowing world and that you have the ability to discover it in your own backyard. So here is my contact information. I also have the website. There's a little QR code where you can just hold your phone camera up to your computer and you should be able to click it without having to type in the whole thing. But thank you all for your time and for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions that anyone has. Has anybody got any questions for Courtney? You know, type them in the Q&A or in the chat box. Or raise your hand. Not yet. Well, I have one question, Courtney. You, uh, you mentioned um, the different species of frog having a certain amount or a certain pattern of biofluorescence, but is it the same color within the species? 
So far, we've only found variation in the amount of biofluorescence or the position on the body. We haven't found okay. a difference in the actual color in the same okay. species. We found that between species of frogs, but not within the same species yet. Okay. Uh, okay, we have, uh, Lisa says, seems like all these animals live in more humid areas. She lives in Denver. Are there biofluorescent animals in dry climates? Yes, so there definitely are. Um, one of the main ones that I can think of off the bat is scorpions, which are a great dry environment um, organism. They are hugely biofluorescent all over. You can take a black light and the filter glasses and they will glow bright blue green all over. So there are many organisms in all environments, but we do see them more in marine environments and in a lot of these tropical ones. But part of that um, specification is mostly from me studying frogs and a lot of frogs are in tropical environments so I gave a lot of those examples. Uh, John would like to know, um, you said you note environment during your research like time of day or mating season. Can the biofluorescence of an individual actually change based on these kinds of factors? So that's one of the questions I have. Because biofluorescence specifically in frogs was just discovered, we don't know. We know that biofluorescence can be um, a sign of aging in other organisms, like I mentioned in fruits and mammal tissues. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a good chance that we could be seeing biofluorescence differences based on the health of a frog or the time of year, or if there's a hormonal um, underlying reason for this biofluorescence, like testosterone or something, that might increase biofluorescence during the mating season versus not. Okay, and Erica says it's an awesome talk. She's curious if you have some insight into why individuals within the same species would vary in biofluorescence. Yes, so that's one of the aspects that I'm most interested in. If there's variation within a species of this biofluorescence, I think that that gives us reason to test if it could be playing a role in their communication. So if biofluorescence is something that's preferred by female frogs and they like males with more biofluorescence, then that variation could help females choose which frog they want to mate with. Similarly, if it's a signal of condition or health, if some frogs have more biofluorescence because they're healthier, that could be a reason why there's differences within a species. Okay. Um. Let's see. Patricia wants to see that last slide again, please. Yes, of course. Let me share my share my screen again. Okay. For you. And Alexa would like to know, she says, great job. Will you be quantifying the color patterns of each frog? Yes, that's the goal. So I'm still working out different ways to quantify the amount and color. I can get the emission spectra of each frog. So that tells me the wavelengths that each frog is emitted. So that tells me the color. But then I'm trying to quantify the shape and distribution and location of these frog patterns as well, especially because we're seeing variation in the extent of that. So yeah, I'm hoping to do that too. I think that you answered her next question. She says she noticed uh, the frogs having some pretty variable patches of fluorescence. So, okay, Greg, can you isolate and identify the fluorophores in different species? Yes, so that's what we're working to do as well. Part of the fun of this being such a new field is there's so much to learn. So that has been done in one frog species where they found it was a hyaline molecule was the fluorophore in the polka dot tree frog, which the, was the first biofluorescent species discovered. But I'm hoping to do that in more species as well, because like we see, fluorescence comes from all of these different fluorophores. And so different frog species could be using different fluorophores to fluoresce. And I think there's a good chance of that as we see some frogs fluoresce in blue and some in green. And so it's likely that there are different chemicals underlying that. Okay. Patricia says, thank you. And Scott says, great presentation. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So much. Um, I have another question. Um, yeah. You're talking about pulling or putting out painted frogs or um, non-painted frogs. And I'm assuming those are in controlled environments. Yes. So have you done anything in non-controlled environments versus controlled environments with predators to see if your non-controlled environment predators are more likely to attack or not attack or that yeah, kind of thing? Yeah, so the predator part kind of has two aspects to it. There's the putting out these models and 
a lot of that is in uncontrolled environments as well. So going to the field site, putting them in as many different locations locations as I can. And then based off of the information we get from camera traps and looking at the bite marks and, and all the marks on the wax models, then we can utilize um, that information to sp pick a specific predator and do um, more elaborate predator encounter experiments um, that are a little bit more controlled. And so if we find out that snakes can see it and it deters them, we could use live specimens in a safe way to um, better understand that behavior. Do you see, oh, this is from Colin, do you see evolutionary transitions in the wavelength of biofluorescence that would make them more difficult to find by predators? If so, does that mean there's a possibility that wavelength predators are able to see would transition as well? Yeah, so I think that's a really <laughs> interesting aspect and something that I think is very likely to be happening. There could be this evolutionary arms race between if females prefer biofluorescent males, but that also makes those males more obvious to predators and more susceptible to being eaten, then I think there's this race where they're going to continue to, to shift a little bit to try to escape each other. But I also have been finding fluorescence in frogs in spots that could be used for mate choice, but also inconspicuous to predators. So for example, under the arms or on the inner thigh, where when they're just sitting on a leaf, the predator might not be able to see that fluorescence, but they could flash it to a female and you could kind of get the best of both worlds there. Okay, Lisa says she thoroughly enjoyed it and learned a lot in 45 minutes. That's Great. true. We did learn a lot. Thank you. Um, do you have any more questions? Not yet. I want to let everybody know that Courtney will be out here on Saturday to do our um, night prowl. Um, unfortunately, it has already sold out um, ahead of time, so that's exciting. Um, but I think we're going to have to do more um, with Courtney because she's obviously popular. So <laughs> we will be doing more uh, biofluorescent night prowls in the future, um, as long as she enjoys the first one. So, um, and I think we need to see that last slide again to get yep. your web link. Let me, that up. I'll need to share again. There we go. There we go. You should be able to see it. Okay. Sorry. I had it up. Okay. Yeah, and that little QR code, you should be able to just hold your phone up as well to the screen and it should pop up on your phone if you don't want to type it all the way in. And Randy and April, awesome talk, Courtney. Great job. Thanks, Courtney. Great job. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time <laughs> to listen. I appreciate it. Okay, oh, we got a cue. Here we go. Did you learn how to design these experiments as part of your studies or do you have to figure them out as you go? That's from Scott. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, because biofluorescence is a field that's relatively new, especially in terrestrial animals like frogs, a lot of it is figuring it out on my own, but it's more adapting other people's, um, what they've done in animal behavior experiments and predation experiments to work with these specific systems. Um, so it's a little bit of both, but that's part of my dissertation process is figuring out these methods for my, for, for answering the questions that I have. And Mike Hogan says, great job. Everybody here says, great job, Courtney. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions out there, I will let Courtney go since so she have an e have a wonderful evening. Um, and we will see all of you next week. If you have a moment to stop by, we'll be talking about foodways archaeology with Dr. Tanya Perez from FSU. And Courtney, we would love to have you join us. And I will see you on Saturday. And yes. if you, you signed up, I'll hopefully see some of you on Saturday as well. Um, and please be safe out there and uh, take care, be healthy, and we'll see you next week. Thank you all so much. All right. Thank you. Bye, everybody.